name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. Now, while someone should warn CUNY students that adulthood is not what it's cracked up to be, <laughs> they are heading for a world of work, but one far different than that that those of us who are um, a bit older <laughs> faced when we ventured out. Technology, hybrid in-office remote work, and gig work have moved beyond the full-time in-person jobs, whether in an office, a school, a manufacturing plant, or retail, we all held or tried to hold. We're here with four, with four New Yorkers involved in confronting that new reality to talk about where we are, how we got here, and where we're going. Grace Rao, who built a career as a political and city hall reporter at New York One, is now the executive director of Five Borough Institute, which just issued a groundbreaking report on how city government can fill a massive number of post-pandemic vacancies. Rafael Espinal was a member of the city council who left to become the executive director of the Freelancers Union, which helps part-time and hoe-based workers, especially in the gig economy, navigate the demands of their economic life. Gregory Morris is the chief executive officer of the New York City Employment and Training Center, which is laser-focused on those new jobs and how to prepare people, like CUNY students, for them. And Lisette Nieves is the president of the Fund for the City of New York, who serves on a mayoral panel exactly, uh, examining precisely the topic we are discussing, the future of workers. Lisette, let me uh, start with you. You were, on the, you were on the mayoral panel. It was formed in the middle of last year. Um, what, why was it formed? What have you been asked to do? What have you been looking at? Sure, thanks for that question. When you think about New York City, let's just say there are a lot of silos in New York City, even when we think about the employment sector or the education sector. And so the idea of putting a task force together was to say, what can we do to create common metrics, an easier front door for employers? What can we do to make sure both higher ed and K through 12 talk to each other? How can we build apprenticeship opportunities? And how can we increase funding for such opportunities? So it's literally a convening function that is being created right now to make it easier to do these pieces collaboratively. And so there are some examples out there that we think are important, like you're seeing large scale CUNY work that's happening right now on paid summer internships that we would have not seen in the past if it was not organized at that scale. So that's the commitment that's happening right now. Um, Grace, the city government itself has been a particular, has been facing a particular problem. There have been massive, uh, people have left in massive numbers. People don't want to come back to the office after the pandemic. The mayor has tried, you know, first demanded that everybody come back to work in office and now is much more flexible after the most recent union settlement with District Council 37, the union for uh, municipal employees. How is this changing? How is the city government itself reacting? Um, well, thank you. Thanks for the question, Bob, and thank you for bringing us all together to talk about this. Um, so what we're seeing in city government is not dissimilar from what we're seeing in a lot of different industries right now that are struggling with employment, right? So anybody who uh, has gone out to eat recently or works in the restaurant industry knows that um, hospitality has had a really hard time with staffing. We're seeing that in hospitals. Certain parts of the country are dealing with teacher shortages. And, and New York City government is also dealing with its own staffing crisis right now. There are 23 thousand vacancies yes. across city government that is five times as many as existed in 2020 at the start of the pandemic just so people have a sense of um, something to compare that to and we're seeing a real impact on delivery of services to New Yorkers so this is not just a case of well you know it's too bad this position's gone unfilled for a while we can make do we're now seeing vacancies at such a scale that it's having an impact on the creation of affordable housing, on the timely delivery of uh, nutrition assistance to building people in need, to building inspections, uh, new bus lanes that are being built. So, so it's having a real impact across the city. And there are a whole bunch of different reasons that are driving this. In, uh, we, as you mentioned, we did a report at the Five Borough Institute on this issue. Um, and what we found as sort of some of the key drivers, they include lack of hybrid flexibility, something that you nodded to. Um, currently, all city workers are required to be in person five days a week. The mayor, as part of his um, 
agreement with District Council 37 has, has agreed to launch a pilot program in June to explore hybrid work, but they haven't sort of committed to a, a, a full program just yet, but we think that's a really important step in the right direction. Um, pay is a huge factor. I, it's also incredibly complicated to get a job in city government. It's overly complicated. There are a lot of hurdles. It takes a long time. Um, and and this cycle has been building in a negative way. So as people have left, they've gone to the private sector where they can get higher paying jobs and have more flexibility. Those jobs haven't been filled. And so then the people who are still in city government are doing more and more, which is leading to more people getting demoralized and frustrated and more people yes. leaving for the door. So I don't want to, we can get into some of the ideas right. that we have about how yes. to address that, but um, just to sort of set the stage for everybody, we're seeing real impacts um, when it comes to the city workforce. You know, uh, Raphael, at the Freelancers Union, you work with people who don't go to the office every day, don't, whether they're entrepreneurs or they're gig workers. I, you know, I know that, uh, um, how do they navigate this? You know, you know, this is, you know, part of the nature of work, even healthcare. If, you know, a lot of stores, for instance, will keep you below 30, 30 hours a week so they don't have to provide you healthcare. So there's a lot of structural issues that people are not going into work. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that uh, the positives of freelance work is that you are able to create your own schedule create your own flexibility, decide who you want to work for. And what we're seeing across the board, uh, especially with younger generations, is that they, they tend to want to work for themselves uh, because they have autonomy over the mission that they're providing this work for, right? Everyone's becoming more socially conscious of uh, what they're producing uh, for themselves and, and for society. Uh, and that is why that, that work continues to be very attractive. But the reality is that that comes with a lot of pitfalls, right? Uh, freelance work does not provide the social safety net that traditional nine to five brings. So healthcare becomes extremely expensive. Uh, paid leave, PTO, uh, taking care of a sick person or a family member or, or raising a kid all becomes Retirement. Uh, a huge hurdle because those programs and benefits aren't there to help you absorb the cost that comes with taking that time. Uh, healthcare continues to be the number one issue that freelancers face because of how expensive it is. Uh, the average healthcare plan is $600 a month. Uh, if you're someone uh, who's freelancing and earning below 100 grand a year, let's say 100 grand in New York City is not a lot of money, right? Because of the cost of living across the board. You, 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 you come to a point where you're thinking to yourself, do I really need healthcare coverage? Uh, is this important to me right now? Am I a healthy person? Can I go without, without, this, extra, uh, without this extra cost uh, on my day-to-day -day, uh, uh, cost of living expenses in the city? Greg, you've been <clears throat> on uh, many different levels looking at uh, <laughs> You know, people going to work, how do they find work, how do employers find employees? Yeah. You know, you've heard what they're talking about. You know, sum up what's going on now. What are, what are people doing wrong? What are they doing right? Well, let, let, let's start from where we are as a city right now. The, 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 we hear that the, the, the New York City economy is starting to come back. Um, it was more sluggish than other cities in terms of the unemployment rates. It's getting a little better, but it doesn't tell the true story, which is there's a massive number of face-to-face -face jobs that were lost and are not coming back. So we're already in a position where a number of entry-level uh, opening door kind of positions are now off the table. So that's part of a problem. The other thing is, I, I would suggest, um, at this particular moment, we don't, or at least this, this administration and, and Lizette pointed to this, and I sat in as part of the Future of Workers Task Force as well, and it was critical and it was a, it was a dynamic gathering of professionals who are thinking about the future of the city's workforce, but we have an immediate crisis, and we don't necessarily talk about it from that perspective. And what does that mean? Well, that means that white unemployment rate right now is about 3%. For, for uh, black New Yorkers, it's about 11%. That should be a crisis point for how it is that we think about uh, equity in our city and inclusivity in our city. When you think about the number of folks in the city right now who, because of the pandemic, needed access to cash assistance, more than 100,000 New Yorkers needing additional resources and supports to be able to live, essentially, at this particular moment. And of course, it was young adults who got hit hardest by the pandemic and their unemployment rates. And what does that mean? Less than a third of young men right. in this city have full-time jobs right. right now. This is a crisis, and as was pointed out, where are we seeing the gaps? 
the gig economy is something we needed to figure out. The freelance space is something we needed to have a better handle on before we got into the pandemic. We're figuring it out in real time. We've got the municipal workforce is a mess right now for a variety of reasons. People working very hard, but didn't have the pathways, didn't have the security. And then it turns out that they don't have the pay to be able to stay in the positions that they're in. As noted, the education system was not one that was creating the platforms to actually prepare people for work. And DOE, or now known as the New York Public School System, as well as CUNY will tell you the exact same thing. And that is they're struggling to find employers on the other end who are willing to take their students in. Where have we made investments? In this city, in particular, as it relates to workforce development, which is the coalition that I represent, more than 250 organizations focused on workforce development. Where have we made the investment? Have we made it the investment in school year? Nope. Have we made the investment consistently in industry preparation and career advancement? Nope. You know where we made it? We made it in summer youth employment. I love summer youth employment. It's a great entry point to access, but it represents six or seven weeks out of the year. What do we do with the rest of our time in terms of creating a pathway for folks to really be able to find employment access? The pandemic pulled the curtain back, and now we're scrambling. You know, um, <clears throat> Chancellor Matos Rodriguez, the chancellor of CUNY, had a recent op-ed piece that ran in AM New York about um, viewing CUNY as like a, um, um, as a civic mobility generator. And, and, you know, and at the same time, the Times... Um, printed a chart of colleges in the in the uh, United States that the you know provide the most economic in, you know entry towards the middle class, which included five which included five CUNY colleges, CCNY, Hunter, Baruch, Brooklyn, and John Jay. But at the same time, you actually see, and you're talking about matching jobs to qualifications. You see states like Pennsylvania, Maryland. Utah, remove a college degree mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. a prerequisite right. for a job. Now, I'm a Brooklyn College graduate. You're I'm a, a Brooklyn, Brooklyn College, college graduate. Queens College. Um, is it Queens? <laughs> yeah. okay. I, don't, I have questions about boroughs <laughs> with papers in the address. That's a, that is a separate point. Um, you know, and I certainly don't want to undercut the, what, the, what a CUNY education meant yeah. for me. Um, but... I mean, you know, yeah. I don't know who wants to jump in on that, but yeah. this is a but this is a movement that is, you know, I don't know if you've discussed yeah. that within the um, no, I, th I think absolutely within the task force. Absolutely, we discussed it. I think one thing in particular. First of all, I'm grateful that I went to CUNY. Mm -hmm. Right, that was an, I'm a first gen from CUNY, and for many Latinos, that was a story. Particularly Puerto Ricans who came here in the '40s, their families. We know, but one thing I think is important is that when we think about CUNY, we always. Now they're finally saying it. 75% leave CUNY debt free. So already. That's the advertising on the subway, right. which is excellent. Which is excellent. But that already tells you that they're already a leg up in the debt game. But it doesn't tell you they're a leg up in the employment game. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge. That's what's not out there. So what are the networks that we facilitate with employers in a way, right? So when I said that CUNY for the first time is doing this organized kind of summer internship with employers that put them on track, mm -hmm. I mean, that's huge. This is the kind of muscle they should have been using to do that. Because there is a piece of it, which is how much moxie does each individual student have to negotiate where they go next, right? And so there's got to be ways that we can figure that out, too. So in some ways, it's a lower cost, but there's also been less support services for students. You may pay more to go to certain other places, but wow, you see the difference in the support services. Doesn't mean I don't love CUNY. I totally love CUNY. But there have been some trade-offs, and I think now having a focused kind of piece on that. So when I'm listening to Grace, and I'll say it's related to this, why are we doing a public service core? Why, why are we doing that? Yeah. Why don't we have a thousand people that we have that then we can decide who's going to be employed after that, who is interested. Again, the government is not one job. There are all these different agencies of which you do not know your connection to until you're there and experiencing it. This, this is why I care about civic engagement and government intervention, because they can do that at that scale. We just, right now, I believe we have the will. We just need a little bit more force. I think a public service corps would make a lot of sense right now. A public works corps would make Absolutely. a lot of sense right now as well to try to get New York back on track. But I'll just note specific, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a Baruch grad. I have my, my oh, master's yeah, in public yeah. administration from, from Baruch. Um, Are you the outlier here? I am. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, look, I... I, I You're going to kick me off the panel. <laughs> right. I, I, I just, 
I want to note this. We have a lot of workforce development providers we work with within the coalition structure that are connected to the city universities. Yes. And what they say at this particular moment is the continuing ed student who's non-degree, who seeks access to credentials and other skills that allow for entry into the workforce or additional opportunity in the workforce, and there's a rich uh, wraparound set of services and supports to keep that student on track who might need some extra coaching, guidance, and support and resource. What they're finding is those students and degree students need the exact same supports right now yep. to be able to move forward. And the reality is the funding doesn't flow as easily from the degree and non-degree programs to ensure that, that folks are positioned. I, I've, I've heard from CUNY, and we've heard from CUNY, from research data, anecdotal evidence and beyond, they're in a tough spot because of those resources that are needed. Um, but I think it, uh, that, you know, what's not represented in the room right now in some levels are some of our employer partners who, who represent the city who need to step up and say, we see CUNY as talent and we believe mm -hmm. in CUNY. So we're gonna, we're gonna create pathways and we're gonna ensure those pathways are in place so that these students, these grads, whatever year they're in, they have a pipeline. Right now, I don't think it's true that our employer partners in many cases are thinking in that way. Well, even the uh, schools chancellor, David Banks, has been talking about career education as opposed to necessarily yeah. um, preparation for college. And that, you know, there are different paths to have a successful economic life. Um, I mean, to what degree people who, I mean, uh, this is a very general question. I don't know if you can answer it. Mm -hmm. Are people in the gig economy by choice or by default? Well, it depends on which industry you're working for, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can make an argument that everyone who works for Uber or Lyft or one of these other app-based right. programs are being forced to be 1099 workers. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say that there are... 1099 meaning the tax 1099 form. 1099 means right. tax form, right. meaning you're, you're right. yeah, collecting uh, as an independent, you're, you're being considered right. as a self-employed individual. Um, but the reality is, is that there are millions of Americans who are doing this by choice. They're, they're seeking this to be their main source of, of income for themselves and for their families. Uh, and freelance jobs, you know, no one's asking for your college diploma. They're asking what kind of skills are you bringing to the table to help me solve the problems I'm having within my company or, uh, you know, whatever small business you're running. So uh, if you're someone who is able to pick up skills, for example, graphic design, construction, uh, plumbing in that same vein, uh, you're a writer, you're good at marketing because somehow somewhere along your, 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 your life you're able to pick up those skills. That is what they're looking for. Um, not to say, not to devalue the college diploma, but to say that especially if you're, if you're looking to get into the freelance market, uh, it's about how strong your skills are and whether you can solve the problems for these companies. You know, the city, part of your report called for a um, to have a person who's into job retention to keep people who are working for the city. Right. And also, for I can't remember the title, but somebody to go out and try to lure people in. I can't remember the, the word. Chief recruit. Yeah, we talked about recruit, yeah, right. creating a chief recruitment officer as well as a chief retention officer. Because there are two. Yes. Right. When it comes to the city workforce, at least, you know, we're seeing there are people. The, the problem is sort of twofold. Well, threefold, actually. But there's the problem of people who are exiting. Um, not just retiring, but like, you know, choosing, they're seeking out other opportunities in the private sector that often provide more pay and flexibility. Flexibility is key, and I think it's like the through line for this whole conversation around the future of work. Um, and then there's the retention piece, right? We, we should be doing more to keep people who are already in city government, especially those that are high performers, that have proven themselves, that have institutional knowledge. We should be doing more to keep them happy and keep them in their jobs and provide more opportunities for career growth within government so that they feel like they can stay and don't need to leave. So there's a lot that we think that the city can do to keep its current workforce happy and engaged, um, as well as to go out and be more proactive about recruiting the talent that it needs. We've seen um, you know, big layoffs across the board in the tech sector, for instance, right? engineers, innovators, people who with skills that are really needed Computer inside of government, right? right? Um, and, and there are other cities, the city of San Francisco, for instance, when these layoffs started happening back in the end of the fall, they were rolling out the red carpet to laid off tech workers saying, you know, we're sorry you lost your job. Come work for the city of San Francisco. We need you. We will put your skills to use. We haven't really heard a call like that from 
City Hall in New York. And we think that there's a real opportunity. There are a lot of tech companies that are headquartered here. We don't want to see anybody lose their jobs. But if you're somebody who might be on the sidelines of your industry for a few years, um, you may be the perfect person to go in and help spearhead new programs and systems that are really desperately needed to make it a lot easier for New Yorkers to interact with government, get services that they need. Um, so, so that's sort of one example uh, on the recruitment side where we think the city should be doing a lot more to be proactive and rather than just sort of a passive employer to go out and seek talent. And and certainly that's what everybody in the private sector is doing. So you're not you're not going to compete with the private private sector if you sort of sit back and wait for folks to come to your website and try to navigate it. And it's an incredibly complicated website <laughs> if you are trying to get a job. Yes, it is. Um, so, so we do think that there's work to be done in both of those areas. Can I, can I add Please. a, Please. Uh, just a quick note. Um, this past Saturday, uh, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services hosted a hiring hall in Queens. It was at yes. Queensboro Hall. Uh, I was there along with a, a lot of folks kind of seeing how this was working. And it was a rainy Saturday. The event started at 10. Every city agency essentially set up with tables, folded tables, staff ready to go to welcome folks who were interested in positions within city government. Uh, scheduled to start at 10. The line started at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, there was, at least for the period I was there, uh, hundreds, 800, maybe 1,000 folks. Hmm. The, the interesting part of the story, I think that, and you highlighted this in your report, which is to say, how many of those folks get offered positions and how long does it take for yeah. them to secure the position and start? Because as your report pointed out, there is a lot of layers of bureaucracy that are sort of gumming up some of these wheels. And this is, partic this is a particular moment when the city has to take a hard look at itself to figure out how we can take talent that's ready to start and make it possible for them to start because otherwise you're, the city's gonna lose out. Mm -hmm. right. On talent. So in I wanted to cases, highlight that. No, no, no. Thank you. I think that that's so that's a great example of the hiring halls. The city is and that's a relatively new initiative yeah. that I think started in just the fall. Um, so that is a the city being proactive about trying to go out and recruit. We think that that's that's great should be you know part of a broader recruitment strategy. But that's a really important step. The fact that 800 plus people showed up on a rainy Saturday speaks to the demand that is out there for these jobs. So it's not like we couldn't fill them. Um, but it, we heard stories from folks inside city government who said even when we convinced a great person to take the job, in, in some cases, it was taking six to nine months mm -hmm. to get official approval from the city's budget office to bring that person on board. And oftentimes, as you can imagine, somebody who you think is a great candidate for a job, they're not necessarily going to wait around six to nine months mm -hmm. to, to know that the job is there. They're, they're going to be in demand and have other offers that they're entertaining. So that timeline needs to be sped up. But I, I should call out since our report came out, we did see the city's budget director issue a memo to all agency heads committing to some flexibility on pay for difficult to recruit mm -hmm. positions where they're willing to go up, I think, 15 percent, and also a commitment to respond to hiring requests within 10 days. I don't know if that means that the person starts 10 days <laughs> right, later right. or you just hear back from them right, within right. 10 days with some sense of direction. But there seems to be a recognition that they need to do better on the timeline as well as the pay front. So, yeah. so both of those are positive steps. You know, I, I do think sometimes, Grace, though, we almost have to double click on this idea of what do we mean by when employers want flexibility? And you talked about mm -hmm. this, too. For so many, particularly for low-income, working-class employees, right, African-American and Latinos, it's about the commute, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about an hour and a half commute to work, right? This isn't about I need more flexibility. It's like I could save the time, mm -hmm. but then there isn't the infrastructure near them to do this. So what would it mean if we had borough-wide centers that people could come that are like WeWorks and do mm -hmm. that? Because they also may not have the infrastructure at home to work remotely, right? So sometimes a conversation around remote work is still we have this image of this younger professional that has their own room, that closes their door, and their tech. The truth is that's not, that's not what we're talking about. Actually, the majority actually represent what I'm talking about. So how do we figure out ways that government could be a bit more flexible but provide some of the infrastructure too? Because that's, I think, what more New Yorkers need. I think we could get more out of that. That's a great point. You know, it's... Um, <clears throat> 
And this also ties in with the uh, with the freelance, the non the non traditional, for want of a better term, is you know the world of work is changing so much, if for no other reason, because of technology. Right. I mean, when we were, when I was a kid, it was the fear of automation. You know, well, automation has gone wild with the technological advances, with computerized, with you know, which has taken something that would take you know days to do, you can do now in five minutes. Now you got chat GPT, which may put us all out of work. You know, you, <laughs> now you have the, uh, you know, emergence of artificial intelligence, robotics. There's a lot of, you know, when I was in graduate school, I worked on an, on an automotive assembly line. You know, a lot of that work is not done by humans anymore. It is, you know, is not done by humans anymore. I would think that you know, I don't want to create a stereotype of a freelancer or some educated person who only wants to sit at home and not be bothered with having to put up with people at work. Um, these are, I mean, these are changing, these are changing realities they have to deal with. Very, very real concerns um, across the board. You know, there's new technology that's just been rolled out in the past few months, uh, like ChatGPT. Uh, there are other softwares that go and produce artificial photographs that look very lifelike yes. and real, uh, meaning there'll be a lot of photographers that could potentially be out of work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that the, the future of, of that space is going to be looking for people who are very well versed on how to prompt these, these softwares and these machines to produce what people, what, what the employers and clients are looking for, right? So, uh, you know, we've been doing the work internally to kind of see what, you know, what, what, we, what steps we could be taking to start educating, uh, for example, writers and photographers and graphic designers uh, to how to start using these tools to their advantage. So when there is a need for uh, folks who have these skills, they'll be able to fill those positions. Well, I roles. actually think that, you know, in looking at what the uh, chancellor, the school's chancellor, not the CUNY chancellor, is talking about it, career education mm -hmm. yes. um, and the um, intense, economically appropriate focus on STEM education and science, technology, engineering, and math education, because we're in a STEM-based mm -hmm. economy and that's going to increase into the future. There's a cost in the, in the, in, you know, in the sense that the humanities mm -hmm. are, you know, I don't, I don't want to say they're withering away, but they're certainly getting shorter shrift, and those writers, speaking as a writer, mm -hmm. um, um, is it, are those less relevant skills? No, they're, they're super relevant. I mean, right? humanities also I'm, gives you a sense of history as opposed to only living in the moment. I yeah. mean, this is a little bit romantic maybe on my part. I don't of course. know. But, uh, you know, a machine will always be a machine. You know, there's a human component, human element, human understanding uh, that, that, that these machines do not bring to the table. So uh, being someone who has these skills is very vital. One, of course, to understand what, uh, you know, what, what writing looks like or should feel like and, and what will create emotional responses. Uh, but you should also learn how to use these machines to your advantage to help uh, make you a more efficient They give you a writer, mechanical advantage. Efficient. Well, exactly. they, they exactly. don't think for you, but maybe, G, maybe artificial your, intelligence. Your, 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 your eight-hour eight op-ed will take you an hour to write uh, using these technologies. Right. It is interesting that technology is cutting across every industry and every sector right now. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and I, I think what we, we, we forget to comment on sometimes and it's, it's important for us to remember, um, this is a city still that has a digital divide in a number of different places. We yes. need to do better in terms of equalizing opportunity, digital access in every borough, every neighborhood, every development, et cetera. That helps us. But also, I mean, I think, you know, in terms of the career pathways in the tech sector related to CUNY, we know that there are some gaps and some evolution that needs to happen. So the employer partners are on the other side of that. But, you know, a recent report came out about some of the absence of computer science access in our public school system. That's right. And that's another gap that has to be filled in a hurry to be able to make sure that every New Yorker has equal access to the opportunity yeah. as, our, as our industries evolve and as the workforce evolves. You know, and, but I think it's like a both and, Greg, because in some ways you're right, there's a digital divide, but I also see so many young people that start with what we call the side hustle, right? Mm -hmm. Who create the market for themselves because they're not treated well in the market. Right. So how many young people are buying and selling sneakers online ahead of time? That's buying and selling and supporting mm -hmm. each other's sweatshirts online. Or do it, they, they, they're doing this earlier than high school, mm -hmm. right? This is what they've created as their marketplace because there isn't, there's so many that are not working, mm -hmm. right? right? 
and they've had to create this. The question then becomes for them too, how do we seize this kind of natural entrepreneurialism there, mm -hmm. you know, anchor it and support it, right? I meet high school students who have been doing Excel spreadsheets because that was what they needed to keep track of their what? Their side hustle, right? No one teaches them Excel, right? So this is an example of where we have opportunity and we also say too, it's all done through the phone now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like how do we make this, how do we, have school acknowledge this is happening. Mm -hmm. that's but right? that's what, that's right. that's that's right. what that's Matos right. Rodriguez at CUNY and that's what that's banks right. in, this, in the uh, public schools is, it seems to be precisely focused on as a, as a preparing you for the jobs of tomorrow, which are actually, you know, well, and this preparing you for the jobs of today. And we, you know, we can only assume that there's going to be some exponential in increase in well, the Well, Bob, demands. then that's going to be a real challenge, right? Because mm -hmm. the truth is we don't know the jobs of tomorrow, <laughs> right? So that's one. Yeah. Two is... And I can say this, as an academic too, not many have worked outside of the universities. And could, no, I'm being honest with you. They have not been promoted or acknowledged for their relationships with the employment sector. So where, what is the role of intermediaries in this? That's an important discussion in this, right? Where's the role of the freelancers union and working with CUNY and finding out, guess what? I want to know those people who are doing a side hustle. I think that's where they should go. They don't have to wait for an instructor to tell them that, right? Like, so there's got to be a way we figure this out a little bit more, because I also think that's unfair to some of the faculty to assume they're going to solve that. I mean, yeah, right, no, I, I agree, totally agree. Um, you know, there is, I think, um, if we want to look at the future of work, we have to look at the industries and how they're preparing to start shifting their workforce. Uh, so they would have to play this important role of being that mediator and uh, provide that knowledge and those tools to the, to the instructors as well. You know, you also have... Um, in particular, President Biden in chip manufacturing, you know, whether you know, there's a That's degree big. of protectionism, yeah. you know, you can look at it as a degree of protectionism, but he's trying to nationalize a lot of manufacturing that moved overseas over the last 40, 50 years. You know, the most, you know, the most significant one is, you know, besides the Amazons in Staten Island, you know, hiring hundreds and hundreds of people yeah. at a warehouse, you also have what's going on up in Syracuse, for example, where they're going to open up this huge... Mm -hmm. Chip so there is some, you know, if that works, manufacturing is going to require a lot fewer jobs than it did when we were younger, when I was younger. But it's not all, um, you know, there still is a place for, you know, there are jobs that cannot be done remotely. You know, you can't have a remote firefighter. You can't have a remote building inspector. You can't have a remote... Um, yeah, or you, or you have to look at the geopolitical context we're in right now, right? Yeah. CHIPS is also about security. Yes, it right? is. Right? And we shouldn't apologize for that. You could call it protectionism, whatever else it is. Mm -hmm. But if that's a way of building more opportunities, mm -hmm. I think that's important. But that's, that kind of commitment, I actually think we should think about the low, kind of the high rate of people who are not working in the public sector as a security issue. It's a security mm -hmm. risk. Right? We're not able to get the services out. Mm -hmm. right? people, more people are disenfranchised. What if we looked at it as a security risk? What kind of investment would we be making mm -hmm. to recruit the talent? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great point. I mean, I think that there is clearly, the talent is out there. Mm -hmm. This is, um, I do think it's a somewhat unique situation that the city is trying to navigate because you know, this may not be an official policy, but in all my conversations with folks inside of government, they come back to the concerns that exist around the fiscal outlook for New York City. Mm -hmm. And so I think that they are coming at this from a fairly conservative crouch, right? They don't want to be in a situation where they're hiring thousands and thousands of workers and then have to lay them off. Mm -hmm. um, but at a certain point, you know, the the costs outweigh the benefits, and we're seeing that in the service delivery. Um, to, to, to the earlier point we were talking about ChatGPT, I think that, you know, this next generation, and for all of us, you know, we are also all going to have to be incredibly flexible in our yes. careers and yeah, how yeah. we think about job training, because it is going to be something that everyone is going to need to do over and over again throughout their lives, right? It, this is not a sort of one and done in college and now you're set off with the tools you need to succeed in your career for an, forever and ever because it's evolving so quickly. And I think with the introduction of something like ChatGPT, yeah. we can only begin to conceive of what the future of work looks like with tools like this and advancements that are happening so quickly that have 
the potential to have such a seismic impact on the way all of us do our jobs, live our lives, and the future of so, so many it's really, industries. So really, my dream of going back to a manual typewriter and carbon paper <laughs> is probably <laughs> not going to work You can out. do that on your own. Yes. Right. <laughs> that would be fun. Let me uh, tell us your name and tell us and uh, tell us your campus, please. Hi, my name is Major. I go to Queens College. I actually have hey. two questions yeah. at Queens College. <laughs> Um, first, you, earlier you guys were talking about retention. I wanted to know exactly mm -hmm. how and what went into that and what was looked into, uh, seeing because mm -hmm. I'm a service worker, I work in a restaurant, and mm -hmm. every, the everyday, day-to-day -day stuff is just, like, can be taxing. And uh, I want to know if, like, the city ever thought on looking into, like, everyday stuff. For retention and work, like, just across the board for all different sectors? Yeah. Not just for city work. Not just for city work. Which is kind workers. of one of yeah. the stuff that... that right. I mean, I can speak briefly and then open it up oh. just on, on within the city workforce. Um, so that doesn't apply to you necessarily in your work. But we haven't seen that be prioritized. Um, in a lot of industries, this may not be the case in your industry, in the restaurant industry, but in in sort of larger businesses, there are regular touch points where managers will meet, you know, for an annual review where there are opportunities to get feedback from employees so that um, managers or sort of division heads have a sense of how people are doing, how they're feeling about their work, how engaged they are. I worked at a company um, for few years uh, before joining Five Borough, and um, we, you know, routinely did employee surveys to sort of keep our finger on the pulse to understand, are there problems brewing? How can we address them proactively? Um, all of those are pretty common um, in a lot of private businesses, a lot of businesses, but we haven't seen that necessarily in government. And so at least when it comes to the city workforce, that's something that we think should be employed so that oh, f long before we had a situation like the one we're in where there are 23,000 vacancies, you know, agency heads can pinpoint problems. They can try to address them before it becomes sort of a snowball. But you also have, you know, since you're in the hospitality industry, in a restaurant, um, you know, Mayor Adams has tried to take a holistic view of employment. People who don't, if you get people not coming back to the office, all those ancillary businesses that serve those people, all the restaurants, all the other businesses around that depend on people coming to the office. And on the other hand, what you have is you have a reawakening of the union movement in the private sector. For many years, when I was a kid, the unions in the private sector built the middle class. Um, for decades, private sector unionization mm -hmm. kind of withered. It really became a public employee phenomenon. And now between the Starbucks and the Amazons, you're starting to see an awakening of, you know, of private sector unionism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I, I think the reality of this particular moment in time that we all realize is that this city is increasingly unaffordable. And the reality is there needs to be the opportunity for folks to be able to increase the wages that they have over time, seek out additional career paths so that they have some sense of comfort and stability in their lives. Companies that do well tend to try to figure out how to invest in that. If they're not doing it particularly well or if there's a desire to do more, you see how the union and labor yeah. folks jump in and try to sort of sort that out or, or direct that in another direction. Mm -hmm. Workforce development providers under our umbrella, I'll, I'll just note, always seek to partner with employers to be able to try to make sure that job placements become opportunities for growth and development over time. And I think we're seeing that the, or we're seeing our workforce have to evolve in some ways to make sure that, th that the resources and supports are in place to make sure that someone who's doing a good job can stick it out over the long term. Yeah, I, I would add something to, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because you're really caught between a rock and a hard place working in this, right? One is for the patron, they're paying the equivalent of 20 to 30% more, mm -hmm. right, for their food. I'm just giving an example, right? Mm -hmm. They're expected to do a tip that's now 25% base sometimes mm -hmm. in some places. And they have less service than they had in the past, mm -hmm. right? So I always think about that service worker so think about both sides of this equation, right? The consumer side is, is saying, and this is at any hotel, this as well, right? The consumer side is saying, I am paying more for less. And the employer is saying, I'm expected to do more without the kinds of protections, wage increases, particularly for tip workers, that we have been fighting for, for, for forever, right? And so that's the quandary we're in. 
what I would say is that's been primarily female staff of color, right? It has been a suppressed workforce. And I think because people have left it, that's now where we see negotiating wage power, which we didn't see it in the past. I will tell you that. And so, but I, you, and I'm sure there's more to that, but what I say, because I want to just give you the context of what, what is both the pull and push pressure that can make change right now. You're in a great position to help make change right now because both sides are dissatisfied. Yeah, I would just add that uh, back in 2018, uh, we created the Office of Nightlife here in New York City, mm -hmm. whose role is to be a support, a support system for uh, hospitality and Which restaurants. Which is a huge across the sector board. of employment. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it was extremely vital, especially during the pandemic, right? It was, uh, the pandemic was a time where we saw a lot of restaurants struggling, having to close their doors. And at the same time, we were applauding all of our service workers, everyone working yeah. in the service industry who were doing the, who were preparing the food, who were doing the deliveries. Uh, and I think the city has done a great job over the over the over the past three years figuring out solutions on how to create a, a more friendly environment for hospitality. But I think it's time that as we move forward, move in this new in this, into this new uh, era, it's time for that office to start looking at the workers. How do we support mm -hmm. those workers? How do we ensure that they have the resources yes. they need? So when we think of the office of nightlife, we're thinking about the businesses, the workers, and the and the and the patrons as well. Yeah, but you know, you've also this is also because this is such a high cost city to live. You know, uh, you made reference to housing, you made reference to how long commutes are. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of demands on people for not that much money. You know, even though we raised the minimum wage to $15, now there's a move to eventually raise it to what, $21.25 an hour? Mm -hmm. It's, it's obscene that the federal minimum wage remains $7.25 an hour. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are very complicated economic factors. And, um, you know, people who are not very well educated may not understand all the forces that they're dealing with, but they're dealing with them. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I mean, I, just, I would just add, you've also flagged health care, the cost of health care significant, and child care. Let's not forget. Absolutely. Yes. Resourced yeah. folks in this city are, are lost right now in trying to figure out how to pay for child care, mm -hmm. which is just another added layer of complexity. Tell us your name and your campus, please. My name is Christian. Uh, Christian, I'm from also Queens College. Nice. And my uh, <laughs> question for you guys today is: There, like, any initiatives, or you guys want to see on a, like a city level, or federal, or state, or federal level to like help ensure the protection of uh, employees or mm -hmm. businesses staying here, like we saw through the pandemic, like a mass exodus to more business-friendly uh, environments or states, as like the tax rate or stuff like that, so. Like well, yeah, I mean, that actually has been going on for a long time, and, you know, except, you know, obviously, very interesting, Michigan just repealed its right to work law. Right to work law is essentially blocking the power of unions. It's kind of a misnomer in, mm -hmm. in what it is. So, yes, so, the, but, you know, I think what he's saying is correct. Is there a counterattack going on? I mean, this is. I mean, there's a marketing campaign that yeah. has launched the We yeah. Heart We Heart NYC. Yeah, come on, who loves right. it? Who loves it? Everybody, who loves that? Who loves that? I, I why it's... people are that upset about that? I don't know. Yeah, uh, but you know, spearheaded by the business community in New York, I think. Um, it's not the most original. You know, it's a, it's a bit derivative of I love New York. Which I think was, you know, <laughs> as I understand on that was done purposefully. But the uh, but the idea is sort of rallying around New York City. And I think historically that's been our secret sauce is that people do want to be here. This is the greatest city in the country and the world. And that argument alone, though, is not necessarily keeping businesses from moving to Florida and employees, um, in many cases, from moving to states like Florida or Texas. Um, but I do think that kind of doubling down on what makes the city so wonderful mm -hmm. um, really needs to be part of a, a long term strategic plan for the future of New York, because it is easier than ever for businesses, for individuals to pick up and move somewhere else. Um, and so we need to think about- Accentuated by remote work. By the accentuated by remote work, physically yes. physically have to yes. be in work. Yes, so then we need to, I think, and, and Raphael and I have even spoken about this, the idea of, you know, we need to make New York a place where people not only wanna be, but that there are benefits to being here 
from just the the mashup of humanity and industries and people and culture. So when, and culture. Um, and so if you're trying to build a business, you want to be here because you can meet the person at the bar or the coffee shop to pitch your idea and get investors. Um, that there needs to be a lot of in-person connection that is fostered here so that there's a real reason to be here. Uh, I think that that needs to be sort of part of the, the long-term vision. Otherwise, if you're doing an assessment of, of what your tax bill is going to be, you're going to pick up and go somewhere else. So, so I Grace, is that also, I think sometimes when we get to talk about New York, and we actually don't get to talk about who stayed here, mm -hmm. right? And plenty of people stayed here. Sometimes I think that's the Manhattan story, mm -hmm. but that's not as much the Brooklyn story. That's not as much the Queen story. That's not as much the, Bron I, I just mean as far as who were the residents proportionally that stayed here and what are the things that they need, right? So if we really thought about what's a retention strategy for the working class, mm -hmm. it would we would have a, more diverse and different conversation than remote work. It would probably be part-time work with benefits, right? Because that's a big piece, because you could work. You're singing his song. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, and I, 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 think, I, I think I think that's huge. I think that's huge. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to get into that, right? I mean, I think that, uh, I think we could all agree that uh, half the reason we a lot of workers take on full-time jobs is for the benefits, right? Mm -hmm. They want to uh, have the security of the health care. They mm -hmm. want to have everything that comes with that social, uh, social safety that it, that it comes with. Uh, but you're able to look around the country and, and pinpoint different states that actually provide a portable benefit that would, if we decided to merge them all together, would provide folks with that social safety net they need to be able to live with the comfort that they be able to live their lives with dignity in our city, right? So if the state of New York, just because mm -hmm. you mentioned state, federal, city policies, if the state of New York was to look at Massachusetts and look at their health care system, why is it in, is in Massachusetts 97% of their residents uh, are, are, have health care coverage? Why, when you look at the California, there is a paid leave model for independent workers that exists there, right? So how do we start formulizing a real benefits for all model so that we, we're less worried about the kind of work we're doing be, just to get the benefits, but actually have those benefits and be able to work on, uh, work, do work, sorry, just, to just, do, just yeah. do the work. You know, Greg, let me, we talked a little bit about this before the show. Um, are too many planners fighting the last war when it comes to, uh, you know, <laughs> both job retention and job recruitment? I mean, look, let, let's start from this last topic. Um, the orientation of the city has been that Manhattan is the centerpiece, and that's changing. In fact, the outer boroughs, in yes. some cases, are doing better now economically. Have, I, that's right. By the way, I don't like the that? term outer borough, but that's and I don't even I agree. <laughs> again quotation marks on that. But let's face it, other boroughs are doing better in a number of different ways. You know, it's interesting when I talk to people in other states about workforce development, um, and I sort of explain the complexities. They say it's the same problems in other states. They just say. Your city is made up of multiple cities. That's your problem. New York City mm -hmm. is made up of five, six, seven, eight different cities, each with its own idea about what needs to happen now without an overarching structure that's saying, how do we make it work where you are right now? So all this to say, you know, we saw the new New York plan roll out the, the blueprint for the new New York, very interesting sort of recovery strategy, trying to make this yes. a more livable city, a more affordable city, a more dynamic mm -hmm. city. The problem is we've got to do two things at the same time, and this is where I would argue we have to evolve in our thinking. Two things at the same time. We have to solve the immediate crisis of folks not having access to opportunities that allow them to live. So employment opportunities, raising the wage floor, addressing all the income eligibility challenges that, it, that, that folks Housing experience. Housing costs. Right, and you got to do at exactly this, and, and that and related to rent arrears and other some of the issues that, right? At exactly the same time as you start thinking about where are we headed? because yeah. this city is not going to look the same 20, 30 and beyond. But if we don't start laying the foundation for that, we're gonna be at a disadvantage. Yeah. And that fighting the old battle about there's one Manhattan and the revenue's gotta come back to Manhattan. If we don't get that right, we're going nowhere. Th it's done. It's like the argument that we're having right now about in-person versus remote versus hybrid. The employers who are fighting now to say, we gotta get people back in the office. As you pointed out, you're eliminating a significant percentage of talent, dynam uh, dynamic workforce, population that is going to say, that doesn't work for me. We've got to evolve in this moment. So fighting the old battles, I don't think is, is going to do us a service, but that means we've got to do two things at the same time. Mm -hmm. We've got to get a job done while we keep an eye towards the future. And that's the hardest thing to do, especially when we think about election cycles, we think about administrations turning over, and we think about the fact that we're all 
quite frankly, traumatized by having gone through a pandemic together. And, and we're also in the midst of an unbelievable migrant crisis, right? And, and I think yeah. this is an example of like, where is talent, right? Yeah. What if we truly saw this as talent and integration, right? That's right. Folks are going to Canada. That's right. Folks are going to Canada because they can be, you know, repatriated much easier, getting into employment. Why are we not taking advantage of this incredible opportunity? Right. Well, on the one hand, yeah. the city is, you know, extremely welcoming to migrants, even Absolutely. if the mayor feels that we're being overwhelmed now. But I did notice that uh, Byron Brown, the mayor of Buffalo, said, send them to me. That's right. Because one is being welcoming, and I get that. And, right. and that's why I love the city, right? I, will, I, I have the heart for New York, right. right? No question. But what is a workforce development plan for folks who are here, too? even young folks who are coming over, unaccompanied minors, right? We've seen, we've seen the articles on how they're going into many other not so good uh, working situations. There has to be a way of seeing that as a focused level of talent, right? But we're seeing it as immediate crisis. That's my challenge here. New York City's vibrancy is always counted on immigration and migration, has always counted. Which is on. why I believe that a process towards whether it's dreamers or a process to yes. legalize undocumented people who that's were right. here, mm -hmm. people who came as kids and now are adults and are living in the shadows. That's right. You know, there's an, an astonishing array of talent and power and creativity that could be unleashed. Absolutely. But, but you can't while un, until immigration is solved. No, I know, but there are ways that we can be that leader, right? There are ways that we could really say a platform, this is an example, this is a model. Right now, we represent the migrant crisis as the crisis, and it's about immediate need, not about what it could look like in the future as integrated talent. Mm -hmm. I think there's a framing issue happening here, too. So, but um, I hope everybody thinks like you, Bob, and we could change this soon. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that there, there are, um, certainly to your point, while there are limitations on what the city can do in terms of yeah. jobs because of yeah. you know job authorization, right. which yeah. all flows through the yeah. federal government. Yeah. I mean, there is job training that yep. could be set up Absolutely. so that when when that authorization does come through, people are ready to go into mm -hmm. the restaurant industry or the nightlife mm -hmm. industry mm -hmm. or all sorts of different careers. But but some of those or technical easy, industries, yeah. yes. Yes. technical industries, right? Exactly. I mean, yep. you know, yep. besides the hospitality industry, the you know, you know, the core of job growth, even with, to me, even with all the automation yeah. and all the robotics and all that stuff, is still going to be kind of an intellectually based engineering, scientific yeah. future. You know, that's where manufacturing is going to be. That's where services are going to be. So, you know, which is why it's so interesting to me, both, both chancellors, mm -hmm. you know, CUNY and, and the public schools talking about you know, I don't think we call it vocational training anymore, which is what, what it was called when I was much younger. Yeah. But, you know, job skills, orientation in what, because CUNY kids, you know, the kids who watch this program, mm -hmm. yeah. they're heading out into a world mm -hmm. that's full of, and I do, as I opened up, I do believe that adulthood is not what it's cracked up to be, but too bad you're heading there. <laughs> um, that, you know, you know, the, the need is compelling and the, and, and the societal demand is so well, compelling. Well, I'd say for a lot of CUNY students and for a lot of public school students, the very young people making adult decisions at an early age, right? So this idea of what is adulthood really varies by family, economic circumstance, those kinds of things. But, but I would say this notion that you go one track or another is false. It, it really, it, it's not binary, right? And, and just like we think about gender change, when we talk to young people, they want to do both. They want to go to school, but they want to be able to do something hands-on so they could see if that's something that they like, right? We don't want to be the European model where at 11 you have to decide what you're going to do for the right. rest of your life, right? People recreate themselves all the time in this country, right? And so, but, but the point is, and going back to what Greg said earlier, when we know less than a third have actually had hands-on opportunity to try something, what are we saying to young people, mm -hmm. right? We're saying, so of course they're craving that. They are craving project-based learning, hands-on learning. The senior year here, why are they in the seats? They should be, in high school, they should be working at companies at least one day a week. I just, internship you know, kind of programs, and, right. and apprenticeship that, internship. But the, right, but the idea is that what does integration mean that if we truly care about young people and integrating them, and they, they don't want one over the other. They do both, you know. And someone who finds their footprint in a school setting to do work, uh, project-based learning, 
hands-on learning experience. I'm getting my exposure while I'm in my 11th and 12th grade, much earlier, obviously, mm -hmm. but everywhere along the way, I'm getting exposed to an employment, a career opportunity. It should not be the outlier that I then find a job at the end of that, or that I find some sort of educational employment pathway after that. It shouldn't be something that's a rarity. It should be more common than not. It's to bring it full circle back to the beginning, the Future of Workers Task Force. It was great to have both chancellors in the room saying, was a we big deal. believe big deal. in career opportunity, and we know we have to evolve to get there. Now, how you take it a ships that big and steer them in a different direction, that takes a lot of time and energy while we have to address immediate needs now. Right. And now we got to get the freelancers union in there mm -hmm. saying, Absolutely. all Love of you who have side hustles, yeah. let me talk to you about how to do a really good side hustle, yeah, right? Exactly. Freelancers yeah. and the workers co-ops, yes, all of that, all that's of that. the new business model mm -hmm. right now. But you know, to come back to a point we discussed before, we only have about a minute and 20 seconds left. You know, side hustle doesn't do justice to the fact that people who take advantage of the freelancers union you know freelancers has a connotation of writers and artists yeah, but it's yeah. a lot broader than that it is broad. right. and this goes back to the question are they doing it by default or by choice i mean by both but for a significant number it's by default yeah i mean I, you can make a you can make that argument across the board in every single industry but i, I think uh, i mean looking at the numbers about 35 to 40 percent of freelancers are doing it full time they're doing it by mm -hmm. choice uh, they're creating LLCs, creating their own companies, creating their own businesses, becoming their own CEOs. Uh, and as you, as Lisette mentioned, a lot of young people will love to have that opportunity to brand themselves. This is why social media is so important, so so popular. They're creating their own brand identity. They they're putting out their own products, they're selling their own sneakers. They're, they're doing this side hustle. Uh, like it's it's people want to take control of their lives. They don't want to be chained to a desk. Unfortunately, people want to have hybrid work opportunities. People want flexibility. Uh, and I think that's the direction we're definitely going to be heading into. Well, we've got 10 seconds left, and I'm going to try to make deadline this time. Thank you for this discussion. I think that, you know, uh, I think I think CUNY students have to make their own opportunities. And thank you, and uh, we'll see you next time on CUNY Forum. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Bob. you.